Public Utilities Commission. I served from four for four years from 2007 to 2011 during the gubernatorial term of Bill Ritter, who actually invented the expression, the new energy economy. He was elected in 2006 in Colorado and made it his goal to make a lot of changes in the way Coloradans used energy and the kinds of resources that uh, was available to them. Uh, Colorado made a lot of progress in those four years, and as I now travel the country, I see lots of places who do some very interesting things. Um, this isn't just about renewable energy, though. It's about the entire prospect of how are we going to make sure that the $2 trillion that utilities spend, including Nebraska's portion of that, gets spent wisely. And my view, and a lot of other people seem to agree with this, is that utilities and their regulators, whether that's public power district and its board or a investor in utility in Colorado and its regulatory commission, they're very good at assessing what the costs are going to be of resources, but they rarely look at the risk. What could go wrong? Why might this not turn out the way we hope it will? You can't ever remove risk, but you can minimize it, and you can make planning for your utility system, just like for your portfolio, for your personal financial portfolio. Either you or an advisor knows how you avoid risk in a portfolio. Well, many of the same principles apply to electric power. So I'm going to give you uh, about, as Ken said, about half an hour of some material that was captured in the report that I recently did, and I see that most of you have it. Uh, this report was done for a group called Ceres, and if you read the description of Ceres in the book, it's a group of investors, their headquarters in Boston, who are um, interested in pursuing sustainable policies in the U.S., not only with energy, but with also with transportation and land use and other things. And Ceres is a bunch of investors, including large pension funds, including a lot of teachers' pension funds, for example, the California State Teacher Retirement Association, one of the largest pension funds in the country, is a member of Ceres, but a lot of corporations are as well. But they're interested in seeing that investors get behind um, sustainable policies. And so they commissioned me and three other co-authors with me to do this report. So we're going to be talking about that for a little while. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about one other project I'm involved in that's very close to the same set of issues. And then I'd like to hear what you're thinking and to the extent I can answer any questions you have about what I've talked about or I pretty much, uh, I speak a lot and I can talk about a lot of things in the energy world. I've been doing this uh, for 33 years. I started when I was nine years old. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, I am, uh, I have a practice called Public Policy Consulting right now. I'm also working 20% of my time at Colorado State University for something called the Center for the New Energy Economy. I was the PUC chairman for four years. Before that, I ran an institute called the Competition Policy Institute. We tried to get competitive policies uh, moving in both telecommunications and in energy. Uh, before that, for 12 years, I was the consumer advocate for the state of Colorado. My job was to represent the interests of consumers before the regulatory commissions in Colorado, the courts, and before the federal regulatory commissions. Uh, I went to St. Louis University for my bachelor's degree, and my uh, master's degree was University of Colorado. Do I have any Creighton fans here, for example? <laughs> Another Jesuit school. There's the report. There are four authors of this. Myself, uh, Richard Sedano, who works for a nonprofit called the Regulatory Assistance Project. He's a, uh, uh, an expert in this area. Denise Fury used to work for Fitch Investor Services and Citibank. She's got the investment side covered in this report. And Dan Mullen is a staffer at um, the uh, series organization. If you want to copy this report electronically, it's available at series.org. They will ask you for your email address, but otherwise the report is free. I don't think they sell your email addresses, and I'm pretty sure they don't send you junk. They just want to know who's downloading this and you know, what part of the country they're in. 
Uh, so we're in an area of high stakes. We've already talked about the U.S. power industry entering a build cycle with $2 trillion in investment. Now, just to put that in perspective, the utility industry is worth $1.1 billion right now. So this is twice as much as today's net, net, net asset value of the utilities. Uh, by 2030, by the time you add two billion to two, excuse me, two trillion to 1.1 trillion and depreciate it, you get a number about two trillion at the end. So they're going to double from 1.1 billion. I keep saying billions, not billions. It's a thousand billion. 1.1 trillion to uh, two trillion by 2030. There's all kinds of challenges that accompany these decisions and drivers. The aging infrastructure, I'm going to show you some slides about where U.S. power plants, what age they are. Um, you know that we're going to need new transmission lines for several reasons in this country, only one of which is to bring renewable energy to markets. But other reasons include uh, increasing the uh, robustness of the network to protect it, to harden it against terrorist attacks. Um, to bring um, power from one region of the country to other regions of the country, things like that. A lot of money involved in transmission. You know that the EPA is following through on both the Clean Air Act and the Clean Drinking Water Act. They are serious now. Um, they were less serious during the last Bush administration, but the courts told them, get busy and start enforcing your own laws. And so that's the impetus for the uh, new round of EPA Clean Air Act regulations. And I think you also know that the EPA is um, also under court order to regulate the emissions of carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas emit emitted by, uh, uh, by utilities, by power plants when you burn fossil fuels. Um, it's getting water and air, uh, I should mention also, water is getting to be a very um, scarce resource. Uh, utilities are among the largest users of water in the United States, and a lot of that consumptive use is running into shortages. Droughts don't help the matter at all. And um, uh, so the EPA is looking at regulations on water use. All these are going to add up to being a very challenging time. Now, Bradle's 2.0 trillion dollars, Bradle Group was the firm that estimated this, uh, about half of it's in the generation area, about 15% is transmission. Still a lot of money, but quite a bit less. And the rest of it's in distribution. That's the lines that run down the alley or undergrounds in your neighborhoods, the lower level voltage lines. And AMI, which is uh, automatic metering or advanced metering technologies, smart meters, um, and also spending money on demand response, the ability to uh, allow customers to actually reduce demand when peak is high on the utility system. Now, I told you the U.S. Uh, fleet is aging. There's the breakdown in 2010 of the U.S. fleet by fuel type. So you can see coal and natural gas dominate. Wind is a now small but growing sliver. Hydro is that sliver, but it's pretty much fixed. There's not a, not a new hydro even possible. So what about how old are these plants? Well, this will show you. This shows the vintage of the plant, the year in which a certain amount of capacity was built. And you can see from this that the coal, which is the black on this, the mean age of coal plants is about 1971 or so, which if you add 12 years to 30, 29 years, you get 41 years old. That's kind of the mean age of coal plants. Now, many of them have a depreciation life of 30 or 35 years, so it's probably past that, many of these plants. Um, the, any plant tends to get any, again, these are at each point, this represents new construction. And as you move along, this, these get more and more efficient, but um, uh, they're, they're old. Um, the blue in here is hydro, which is pretty much, as I said, fixed and not growing. The, this color, which is supposed to be is the nuclear plant, you see the nukes were built in the 70s and 80s for the most part. No new nukes really after 1990. Um, wind doesn't show up until the very end here in 2006 and thereafter. This is all natural gas. Now, I'm going to just say a couple things about what this is. I told you this was gigawatts of capacity. 
This isn't energy. This isn't the amount these plants generate. It's the peak that they could generate at. Coal tends to be much more of a base load. So if you were looking at a percentage on an energy basis, the base load plants, the nuclear coal, will be a lot larger portion of the scrap. But this is our capacity. Everybody know what I'm talking about here? Things and yeses. Okay, good. Um, if you go back, and again, this isn't my study yet. I'm reporting on others that were used as the basis for this. If you go back and look at regions of the country, the West uh, is projected to add about 200 billion in investment over the 20 years. The Midwest, uh, more than 220 billion. The South, which is tex largely Texas and um, Florida, really, those are the drivers. And Georgia in the South. Uh, is a whopping uh, $450 billion over that 10 years. And the Northeast, which really isn't growing much in load, will require much less investment. That's the estimate. Now, don't worry about what the components of this are. You'll see a certain amount is renewable, a certain amount of combustion turbine. Nuclear is a big chunk. Um, these were the estimates done for this report in 2010. A lot of the cost numbers have shifted. The top, the, the height of these columns will be about the same, but the mixture inside will probably vary. Now, I told you that uh, utilities were under a lot of financial strain with this. This is, I think, a very interesting graph. This is the bond or the financial rating by the, the standard employers of the world of utilities every 10 years beginning in 1970 and working up to 2010. Just look at the first column. In 1970, 40 percent more or less of all utilities were single A rated and about, that's my telephone, let's just ignore it because it moves away. <laughs> uh, about half of the utilities were double A and there were even some triple A utilities in there. Sorry about that. By the time we get to 2010, the AAA utilities have disappeared. The WA utilities have practically disappeared. There's only a few single A utilities. B, triple B and triple B minus are the predominant financial ratings. A triple B minus is the lowest rating you can have and still be financially great. Most Institutional investors and funds could not even buy a triple B, a, a, a double B, or a single B or a C rated utility. So, in all, the utilities are weaker than they were financially. They were weaker than the last time, which is going to make all this more challenging. I keep adding these bricks to the wall here to convince you we have to really, as a society, pay attention to this because we could go way wrong and cost ourselves a lot of money. So that's the question, how do we spend it wisely? Um, this is, uh, for many people, one of the more interesting charts in the book. This is a consensus estimate of the levelized cost of power of a bunch of different kinds of resources, ranging at the bottom here on the list, energy efficiency through natural gas, wind, geothermal, biomass, large PV, solar thermal, polarized coal, um, Regular coal, nuclear, or coal uh, integrated gasification, combined cycle, that's coal gasification, nuclear, and coal with uh, gasification and combined uh, uh, carbon storage. So anyway, let's go to the costs. The length of these, bar th these bars on the bottom here represents cost per megawatt hour. So for example, onshore wind, the cost all in of inshore wind is somewhere between $50 a megawatt hour and 125 something like that. That's the cost curve. This is the subsidized with federal incentives built into it cost. That's the one we actually see. So every time there's a pair of bars, one is the total cost with incentives and the other is the total cost without incentives. Now you can, let's just say a few things about this. You'll see some of these pretty wide ranges. That depends upon the area of the country you're in. Wind in Nebraska and Colorado is down here in the very lower reaches of these costs. By the time you get to, oh, I don't know, in Ohio or certainly in Georgia where the cost of where the wind just doesn't blow that much, uh, you see much higher costs for, for installed wind. 
So this is the consensus estimate of these costs from three organizations, the Energy Administration, the Energy Information Administration from the Department of Energy, the California Energy Commission, and the investment group Lazar. So they put all their numbers together and came up with this chart. So a couple more things to say about it. The red, yellow, and orange colors up here represent the cost of coal under three different assumptions about the cost of carbon attached to that. So stated another way, this point right here is the cost of coal with no carbon cost. That's the cost of coal with $15 a ton carbon cost, $30 a ton, and $45 a ton. Everybody with me on that? So that's depending which assumptions you want to make about the cost of carbon. For natural gas, uh, the carbon numbers are smaller because it emits uh, it emits less uh, carbon dioxide, so it's less, um, and of course the renewables have no carbon impact. Um, so we're going to come back to the ingredients of this, but this starts to show you what the relative costs of generation resources are. So we took all these numbers and we, oh I should have, I forgot, uh, I added this to the slide. So with incentives, without incentives, I should have said damn. I'm just sorry. I had thrown out of the meeting earlier because Dave apparently is not said in Nebraska. Is that right? No, okay, sorry about that. With incentives, without incentives, and as I said, those are the CO2 costs, just so you know what those are. Now, there's a caveat to this graph. We took a graph which was produced in 2010 by three different organizations. We didn't want to modify any of the assumptions, so we had a consistent set of data, even if Things had changed since then. We didn't want to have to explain changes we made to a study, so we left it alone. But here are some notes about that study. Uh, first of all, the unadjusted 10, uh, 2010 cost estimates were used for consistency. I just said that. We made no adjustments to them. The costs for wind and photovoltaics have fallen sharply in the last two years, much more quickly than these studies anticipated in 2010. So you have to mentally make adjustments on wind and solar that have gone down. I was quoted, well, I'll come back, I'll come back to that. I was quoted prices by the utilities I met with here today, with the oh, fire districts here for wind in Nebraska at about $25 a megawatt hour. We'll go back and look at where 25 would be in those charts. You'll see they're off, literally off that chart. Uh, the cost of nuclear has probably risen post Fukushima. There is um, a lot of um, thinking that new regulations for safety and certainly new financing costs for nuclear are going to drive those costs higher than what was assumed in 2010. Let's just go back and look where 25 is on the onshore wind. Here's 25 right here, and you'll see we, and th this is the subsidized cost. So we're below, in 2012, we are below the low point for 2015. So there's reason to think it'll get even better. So what did we do? We took those, that data we just were looking at, we ranked it. You'll find this in the book. There's a ranking from highest cost to lowest cost, taking the midpoints of those ranges. But that's not the whole story. There's risk involved in the choices that you make, and this is the main lesson. We identified what we call cost-related risks. There's the risk that you'll have construction cost overruns, famously for some projects. There's a risk that um, fuel costs will escalate faster than you anticipate. It has, over time, jumped around. The price of coal is now it's woken up, if you will. After many years of being pretty flat, it's starting to increase and the cost of transportation for it as well has. Some of these investments are bet the company investments. They're so large that um, it would swallow a company if they got in, into one of these investments. Right now there's a utility in Florida called Progress Energy, which has spent a billion and a half dollars on a nuclear power plant. They have nothing to show for it yet. They haven't broken the ground. The original cost of the plant was estimated to be Six billion dollars. The new estimate is 27 billion dollars, so four times. They didn't set out to build a 27 billion dollar power plant, and they made probably good faith decisions at the beginning to 
start this, but that's what they are on track to do. It will never be built at that cost. There's no way, I mean, you'd be talking dollars per day for, for residential customers in Florida, multiple dollars per day just to get that plan. Um, there are also a category of risks we call time related. What if you have delays in construction? What does that do to your cost structure? Great significance, it turns out. What if uh, environmental regulations don't turn out to be as easy as you thought they might be? What if they're hard? And what you just built has to be cleaned up after it's built, essentially. Um, what if uh, there's a catastrophe at the plant? These are all things which can apply to any plants, but if you start looking at different kinds of plants, they apply differently. And that's the lesson here. So we combine all of those into one set of risks that we use for, cons for construct for a scoring. Construction, fuel and operating, the cost of new regulations, the risk of new regulations, the risk of a carbon price, water constraints, the capital shock risk to a company undertaking projects, and planning risk. That refers to what if the plan that you accommodate this plant that's going to be built six years from now, what if things change? What if Nebraska loses or gains uh, load? What if uh, new technologies come along and displace uh, what you're doing? What if a competing technology has a lower cost profile than the one you're building? So that's what we did. We put those all in a blender, and you can read about the computation. And so now here's our, our cost ranking. You saw this before. Next to it now is a risk ranking. So the same set of resources are now rated from high to low on their risks. You probably aren't surprised to hear that all the possible investments that you can undertake, we deem nuclear to be the riskiest. Now, that's not to say you can't build a nuclear plant for what you think you're going to build it for. You might be able to. But then again, you might not. And if you might not, you might end up with $27 billion instead of $6 billion. Big problem. So uh, there's several interesting things here. So, so that's size that cost and that is risk. Nuclear goes from sort of middle of the pack on cost to top of the pack on risk. Uh, polarized coal, actually you can't even build under the new EPA regulations a polarized coal plant. This was actually done before they adopted those regulations. So if I needed to prove the case, I've probably just done it currently. They've adopted rules that says that a new coal plant can emit nothing, no more carbon dioxide than a efficient natural gas plant does. Now, you can capture the CO2 and stick it in the ground or turn it into bicarbonate of soda or something, but actually those technologies aren't really available, but perhaps on the horizon, I hope they are, um, but right now you could not even build it. So there's a risk, so the risk maybe becomes interesting on this one. But look what happens to large solar photovoltaics. It's Remember, this was the old price, by the way. I didn't adjust these, so it probably wouldn't be quite as high on the list, but on the risk list, it drops fairly lower. You're now hearing prices for solar and utility scale in the West with reasonable insulation, that is, solar resource, of eight to nine cents per kilowatt hour, 80 to 90 dollars per megawatt hour. Those are very competitive with these other technologies. But the real takeaway here, in some sense, is this energy efficiency shows up as being both least cost and least risk. It's, it's already understood to be least cost. Least risk, why? Well, in part because it's small. It, it shows up in small increments. It doesn't take long to undertake. So you avoid all of those big bets kind of risks, the planning risk, the capital cost risk. There's no fuel. Um, there is a risk that it won't materialize. You might pick a bad program which doesn't last the 20 years that you expect. But that's sort of moderate risk compared to the kinds of catastrophic risk that other resources can undertake. So I put all of that information about cost and risk on a single graph. Across the bottom you will see increasing risk and up at the top increasing costs. So that's really the same data they just presented in another form. We conclude, and again, I give this presentation in front of regulators and regulated companies. Now, public power is a different animal. You are not regulated by the state. You are regulated by your board of directors. Um, 
So the advice, I guess, would apply to the boards of directors of the public power districts. But more generally, this public power means that the citizenry is somehow the owner of the district. I mean, you're the, you're the voters who elect the board. You're the right payer of owners of it in some sense. The, the strategies that we look at first is diversifying utility supply. Just like your investment portfolio at home, you wouldn't put all of your money in one basket or even two or maybe even three baskets. You would go to 15 baskets. You need to do something similar with utility portfolios. You must utilize a robust planning process. Now, robust is an overused word these days. What I mean by that is uh, best industry best practices brand, okay? So you basically construct portfolio, I'm gonna show you one minute. You basically te you test out portfolios against possible futures. You vary the inflation rate, you vary the coal price, you vary the EPA regulation, you do all these things, and you see which of those portfolios actually work out better for you over the long run. Um, transparent rate making practice. Don't hide the risk. Don't bury it in some other decision or uh, make it possible for the utility to undertake an investment it shouldn't make. Um, I, as a public utilities commissioner, um, I made sure that we had as much um, openness as we could possibly get about the processes at our commission. When we did our big planning process, we had 34 legal entities intervening before the commission. Every organization you could name with an interest in energy was part of our hearings, and they got time to present witnesses and to cross-examination, cross-examine the com company and other interveners. We got very accepted decisions that way. You end up getting much more buy-in if you conducted a really open process, and I hope that you're able to do that here. Um, I like financial and physical hedges. Um, the utilities in Colorado that I regulated bought some long-term natural gas contracts um, so that they weren't going to be surprised by ups and downs in the market. They also utilized storage of natural gas on a seasonal basis to make sure that they had no surprises. Um, you, one, we all need to hold utilities accountable. When they make a commitment to do something, make them do it. Make sure they do it. Don't simply lose interest in what they're doing and sort of let them off the hook. That's not going to be productive for either the utility or the ratepayer or the regulator in the long run. Um, these more apply to regulators than they will to you. Um, I will also, uh, also say, though, that utilities are really morphing, they're changing a lot, their business model has to change because the world under their feet is changing. Now, I'm gonna show you the example of a really, uh, what I would conclude is a really robust planning process used by the Tennessee Valley Authority. Now, they're an interesting choice. Uh, first of all, they did a very good job, that's why they were chosen, but they're also not one of the greenest utilities in the country. They were never considered in the southeast of the United States to be that progressive. But they have had strong to a planning process, which I think you'll want to agree with me, is pretty interesting. The first thing they did, is what I, my other graph showed you what we should do, is they looked at a dimension not only of cost, this uh, PVRR, is present value of revenue requirement in $2,010 in billions. So they looked at the cost on this axis. On this axis, they're looking at the risk, just what we have on the other graph. These aren't single plants, these are bundles. These are, these are portfolios. The first portfolio they examined was strategy A, which was a limited change in what they were doing. Pretty much, let's hold the course, let's do what we've been doing. That plots up there. The next one they said, well, We'll change some things, I don't want to get into detail, and this will become the baseline. So th this was a, a, a different than hold the course, but not radically different. They said, well, what if we use diversity as our whole star? What if we said we want our portfolio to get more diverse? Well, on a risk and on a cost basis, that ended up being better than either of the other resources. The other, they, they said, well, we're a nuclear utility. Let's think about expanding nuclear as our growth potential. Well, that plotted out as a D, higher in cost and risk than these others. 
The fifth portfolio type they looked at was what if we did more energy efficiency, more renewables, and more demand response. That was E, pretty good in this scheme. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> now you probably all know a little bit about risks and bonds and stocks and how you have to mix them and you get different results if you do different mixes. That curve that you get is called an efficient frontier and you can develop that and that basically shows you the place that you want to be on that line somewhere. And so what they constructed eventually was another portfolio which looked a lot like E and C, more diversity <coughs> and more energy efficiency and more renewable. And that ended up being the least cost and the least risk. So that's what the analysts recommend the board of directors of, EP, excuse me, of TVA. This is the kind of robust analysis you have to do. Now, to get those plots on the graph to decide what is a nuclear, uh, a nuclear portfolio, where does it plot, or where does the, what we're doing today plot, you have to do some pretty sophisticated analysis. Usually it's called uh, Monte Carlo simulation, where you come up with a portfolio and just throw all kinds of assumptions at it, random, what happens if, what happens if 40 different things happen. You do that over and over and over again and you start to get a picture of where these portfolios are going to perform. That's exactly what the analysts for your mutual funds do. Exactly. Okay, what are the rewards if you're smart about how you make decisions? Well, first of all, consumers will keep more money there will be a lower cost. It won't necessarily be today's lowest cost, but over the time frame that we're looking at, it will be the least cost. The utilities, um, they will have better corporate health. I'm proud to say that in the four years I was the chairman of the Colorado Public Utilities Commission, Excel Energy went from triple B to triple B plus to A minus. So they moved up three, or moved two uh, links up the rating chain. And that was with adding a whole lot of renewables, mostly wind in Colorado. Investors, you're the investors in your utilities. Um, safety, value, and clear expectations. You won't have surprises. Uh, employees, uh, we, we opine that the employees of the utility companies will have more pride in their company if they have a direction they're heading in. It's one that society embraces and it's one that promises customers the kinds of outcomes we're looking at. Um, public profit, again, for regulators, I think there'd be more confidence in the process. And bottom line, society is spending its precious capital more wisely. Now, I'm going to almost stop here. I have one more small topic to talk about. It's not small, it's going to be short. Um, a project that I call Utilities 2020. Um, two of us uh, uh, were founded by the Energy Foundation. We are two former state regulators named Ron, as it turns out. It's <laughs> me and a guy named Ron Blair. Um, we're advised by a board of experts from around the country. Our goal is to explore new business models and advocate new regulatory models to enable utility business models to evolve. That's a lot of words to say utilities have to change all kinds of things going on that were never contemplated by the utilities of the 1960s or 70s. The environmental piece is just one part of it. Costs of technology fall. We've been talking about putting solar in fields and selling the power to utilities at rates that are possibly cheaper than what they can generate for themselves. All these are really changing the game for utilities. We interviewed CEOs and leading state regulators around the country to, to uh, run this project. We evaluated systems both here and abroad, and we had dialogues, uh, the next one coming up in October in Denver, between utility executives and commissioners. You have to translate this to your situation, but I think you can see the analogs. Uh, what we've heard from utility CEOs is that they want a clear, more consistent direction from state energy policy. I might have heard that this morning um, in a meeting I was in, that there really isn't a state energy plan. It would be nice to have some direction about where this is all headed. Utilities have very little incentive for innovation, certainly the, the investor-owned utilities. Um, I was told by an investor-owned utility CEO, well, you know, what's the upside of me spending money to lower my costs? The most, my, my best case is I get my money back. I don't make anything on that activity. Another one said, 
why would I do that? They take it away to the next rate case. Now, you don't have rate cases, but I would ask you to examine whether you have incentivized the public power districts to be as efficient as possible. Commissions need it. Commissioners, regulators need a better understanding of utility business and its needs. This is from the mouth of the CEO. Some of them said that the regulators, maybe this will be true of, I'm not putting words in anybody's mouth here, but I heard words like they have a profound ignorance of what the utility actually needs and does. There needs to be a better education process. Utilities told us they want certainty on climate policy. They're not dug in either way about whether the climate is changing or isn't, but they just want to know, what do you want us to do? Several utilities said to us, you mistake our greatest, our greatest advantage. We are very good at managing large projects, getting them done on time, running them well after they're done. That's what we're good at doing. Uh, they don't want to be the ones in this country to decide our climate policy or our energy policy. And they want healthier working relationships with the regulators. What about the commission? Uh, well, commissioners, the first word out of their mouth was always, what's going to happen to rates? That's a worthy concern, but it's twofold. It's short run and it's long run. You've got to look at the longer run, not just the short run. Um, by the way, I, I, uh, in Colorado, we had a very um, pleasant experience with going from uh, effectively 0% renewables to about 16% for Excel. Their rates have gone up in total less than the rate of inflation over the last six years. And of that increase, so it's, it's not zero, but it's less than inflation, of that increase, only 2% of it is due to the cost of renewables in our state. Bottom line, wind pulled down the cost of service and solar raised, but the net of those is only about a 2% increase attributable to that. Now that's just the cost to utility customers. The benefits to society included 29% reduction in carbon emissions from Excel Energy from 2005 to 2018, and uh, lower uh, other emissions, uh, carbon monoxide, carbon uh, uh, sulfur dioxide, noxious, nox, noxious um, oxides, uh, and things like that. Uh, regulators are open to modifying the regulatory body, but they're looking for ideas. I'll bet you that would be the same if I interviewed the board of directors of the public power districts. I'm going to guess they're interested in new things, but are probably looking for, I don't mean this in the negative, that they're, they don't, they're not leaders themselves, but this is a business where you really have to look at national and worldwide trends, something which our project is hoping to do. Uh, the commissioners don't particularly like the adversarial process that they're locked into. Uh, again, these are commissioner things, so I'm not going to uh, spend any more time on those. Um, the last slide of today is what I call a paper that I wrote, which combines the two things I've talked about today. Uh, risk aware planning, and you can, that's the booklet you have. You can read a short form of that. It's actually got some slightly different material in it, but pretty much the same thing. And a new model for the utility regulator, uh, regulator relationship, that's that second half of utilities 2020. That's available online at electricitypolicy.com. I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's free. If for some reason that isn't uh, easily available to you, uh, first of all, I will get a copy to send your car, so you will definitely have that if you want to get a hold of him, or you can email me. So I'm going to stop there. I've got a couple more conclusion slides that will be repetitive of what I've talked about. And I'm at about the time I'd like to stop and uh, be really happy to talk with you with the questions you